Enter, rejoice, and log in. Enter, rejoice, and log in. Today will be a joyful day. Enter, rejoice, and log in. We light this flame as a symbol of new life enlightening our way, okay. as a symbol of the warmth in every human heart. Let, Let the, the lighting of this flame rekindle in us the inner light of hope, of peace, of love. May we share that light with all people. Good morning. I'm Leah, one of the ministers here at the Fellowship. Thank you for welcoming us into your home today. It is good to be together, even when we have to be physically apart. If you are joining us from another congregation, then welcome. I want to say a special hello to those of you visiting from Lakeshore Unitarian Universalist Fellowship in Manitowoc. I've enjoyed guest preaching there over the years. You have a lovely community, and we're so glad to be able to host you here with us this morning. If this is your first time visiting the fellowship, then we extend to you a special welcome. I hope you will reach out to us to find out more about our fellowship and how we can welcome you into spiritual community. Our director of congregational life, Marie Luna, would be happy to help you get connected here if you send her an email. She's taking this Sunday off for some much deserved rest, but her email address will be in the chat box. Today's service is being led and supported by Reverend Christina Leone Tracy, our senior minister, me, I'm Reverend Leah Angiri, the associate minister, Allie Peters, our intern minister, Steve Seek, our music director, and all of our wonderful musicians and singers, and Adam Robinson, our AV tech, who supports all our technology from his own home. Thank you to everyone who made this morning's service possible. This year, we are focusing on growing resilience. We're digging in to what it means to grow ourselves and our communities to be sources of life, even and especially when things get tough. Right now, we're in the weeks of our theme, A Community of Embrace. Thank you for joining us as we practice what it means to embrace each other and our wider world, and to really hold each other, even from a distance. We're so glad you're here. I invite you to settle into your space, wherever you are, setting aside your week in whatever way you are able, so that we can be fully together, even from afar. Each of us, no matter our age or stage in life, is always on a journey. Our seven UU principles call us to a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. Our seven UU principles call us to a free and responsible search for truth and meaning, and we take time each week when we gather to hear stories and explore ideas in new ways. So today I have my wonder box here, and I'm wondering if you have any guesses of what might be inside. I hope people will type their guesses into the chat box or kids feel free to type or ask your grown-ups to type into the chat box what you think is in the wonder box today. Any guesses? How about you, Nevin? Do you have a guess? I have a guess. 
What do you think is in the water box? Pizza? That's a good guess. Or maybe it's a turkey? Yeah. Or or could it be some leftover Halloween candy? Yeah. Yeah, these are all really good guesses. I enjoy reading the guesses that you put in the chat box too. Thank you so much. Okay, it's time to find out. Drum roll, please. What's inside our wonder box? What is it, Evan? It's a picture. It's a picture. What's the picture of? Reverend Leah hugging. Oh. Oh, it's a picture of you and Reverend Leah hugging inside our sanctuary. Maybe we can put the picture up on our screen so everyone at home can see. Yeah. I'll let Adam do that. Yep, this was a really sweet moment during the celebration of my installation as the fellowship senior minister a few years ago. We had both been given really beautiful stoles that had been made by Mary Gerlach. We were just feeling so supported and loved by everyone in our community, and we were so grateful to get to minister alongside each other. So we just embraced. Oh, what a beautiful moment, Christina. I wish I'd been there. It was one of the things that I miss most about not being in person. I hate not being able to hug people. Of course, not everybody loves hugs. Some people prefer a high five. Can we have a high five? Or a fist bump. But I'm a hugger. I enjoy that physical embrace. That's what we're talking about right now in our services, right? Embrace. But what does it mean to embrace each other when we can't give each other hugs? Good question, Allie. Oh, I have this for you. It's a picture. Oh, a card. Thanks, Christina. I love getting handwritten notes and pictures. That kind of feels like a hug. What are you? Oh, and someone dropped this off on my doorstep this morning. I love getting food, especially soup. And that, to me, feels like an embrace. And we at the fellowship always have people who are willing to make food for people, especially when they're sick or struggling in some way. Yum. What a kind way to hug from a distance. Logging on to the services each week feels like that to me too, especially seeing the people who sent in their photos or are singing songs or lighting the chalice or offering a testimonial. It's so nice to see everyone's faces and to hear their voices. I love that too, Allie. Every time I log on, I scroll through all the faces in the Zoom video squares. Don't we do that? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, and it feels like an embrace to see all the people gathered together. There are lots of ways that we embrace each other from a distance. Hang on, buddy. Even though it's not safe to hug right now. Yeah, if you if you at home have any other ideas of ways that we can embrace each other, go ahead and type them into the chat box. We'd love to read them. How about a hug? Hug! Yay! <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Allie. Thanks. Thanks, Nevin. Thanks, Christina. Bye, guys. first reading this morning is a poem entitled Embrace, and I wrote it for this morning's service. Each Sunday, these are the words I would utter at the end of the service as I lifted my hands and my eyes to those who are gathered. Go in peace, knowing that we wait to embrace you upon your return. Upon your return, an embrace waiting. We are a people of embrace waiting to wrap our arms and our hearts around each other, gathering, committing, and holding out hope for return. 
And then this, Zoom, masks, distancing. We are still a people of embrace. And now the words that close our service each week are a little different. Go in peace, knowing we embrace each other even now from a distance. We are still a people of embrace, waiting, embracing now and again and again and again. Our second reading this morning comes from the small UU meditation manual called Breaking and Blessing. The reading is entitled To Invoke Love by Reverend Sean Parker Dennison. To invoke love is to ask for a hug from a thunderstorm. Spill tea in the lap of the infinite trickster to make the biggest, most embarrassing mistake of your life in front of everyone who matters. To invoke love is to never know if it will come softly with the nuzzle of a beloved dog or pounce right on your chest with the strength of a lioness protecting her cub, her pride, her homeland. To invoke love is to take the risk of inviting chaos to visit the spaces you spent so much time making tidy and watch as the breath of life scatters everything you have just folded and put away. To invoke love is to allow for the possibility that your words and actions might become so empowered you can no longer believe in apathy or the self-righteous idea that nothing can change. To invoke love is to give up self-deprecation, false humility, pride, to consider yourself worthy to be made whole, willing to encounter love that will never let us let each other go. To invoke love is to guard against assumptions, take care with our word, and practice forgiveness, not as ethereal ideal, but right here in the messy midst of our imperfect lives. To invoke love is to approach each day and every person with wonder anticipating love's arrival. Is this the moment? Is this love's grand entrance? Is this person the embodiment of love? Am I the one? To invoke love is to play the fool, the one more concerned with loving than with appearance or reputation, the one ready and willing to be vulnerable abandoning anything that gets in love's way. To invoke love is to be ready to become love, here, now, in everything we do. Are you ready? A few years ago, I was going through a personal rough patch in my life. I was exhausted and stressed and burnt out at my job as a middle school teacher, and my anxiety was in full swing, and there was a serious lack of joy in my life. One day I was talking about some of these struggles with my therapist, 
and she asked me a simple question. She asked, what do you do in the evenings to unwind after work? I thought about it and I answered, I don't know, watch TV, I guess? Puts around on the internet, maybe? She gently offered that these are things that aren't very energizing or joyful. And we talked a bit about some other suggestions of things that I could do that might be a better use of my time. And at one point she said, do you ever just call a friend? Well, sometimes I guess, but, but we usually schedule time to talk ahead of time, you know? I mean, my friends have so much going on in their lives, I don't want to bother them or interrupt their lives. They don't need to hear about me and my problems. They probably have something better to do. My therapist just simply answered, well, if they do, they'll tell you and you can just talk some other time. What's the big deal with just calling? She makes it sound so simple, right? What's the big deal with just calling? But when we're not with our friends or our community in a physical space, reaching out and staying connected takes a little bit more vulnerability than usual, doesn't it? It takes a little bit more effort. We may have to go out of our way a little bit to connect. And when it comes to love and connection and community, Making an effort and going out of our way is a vulnerable thing to do. What if I'm bothering this person? What if they don't want to talk? They probably have other people in their life they'd rather spend their time with. What if they think I'm weird or, or needy? When the pandemic started, I remembered my therapist's suggestion. Do you ever just call a friend? So one day I did just that, despite second guessing myself. I mean, I almost talked myself out of it. This particular friend was an old friend. We're very close, but we don't talk all that consistently. And she has two small children and she works as a college professor. And so she has a lot going on and I, I didn't want to bother her. She doesn't need me taking up her time, I told myself. But with my therapist's words ringing in my head, I called her and I asked if she was busy, saying I just wanted to say hi and to see how she was doing. And she asked me if she could call me back after she put her boys to bed. And then we talked for maybe an hour or so. And then about a week later, she called me out of the blue. She said she just wanted to say hi and to see how I was doing. Our conversation spurred more phone calls and throughout the past few months, she's been sharing more texts and pictures and stories of her boys. And I've been sharing more pictures and videos of my dog. From her home in Ohio, she was amazed to hear that it has already snowed here in Wisconsin. And she was excited to share with me how proud she was of her son when he told his grandfather that nail polish wasn't just for girls and that he loved his red nails. And she's now waiting to hear about the results for my dad's bone marrow biopsy whenever we get those. We are embracing each other, even from a distance. It seems small, but it's actually making a world of difference. And all it took was reaching out. 
I love the piece that we read this morning by Sean Parker Dennison. And I especially love the part where he says, to invoke love is to play the fool. The one more concerned with loving than with appearance or reputation. The one ready and willing to be vulnerable. That's just the thing. Love doesn't happen if we don't allow ourselves to be vulnerable. To throw away the second guessing and to just reach out in whatever way we need. And that's something that I'm trying to do more of moving forward. And I hope that you will join me. Thank you. Good morning. Before we get to our sermon, I wanted to show you a beautiful sanctuary. still here waiting for us. This month, as we are continuing and finishing up our worship theme, a community of embrace, it has meant so much to me to see the pictures that many of you have sent in, arms outstretched, ready to offer a hug. Me, I'm a hugger. As I mentioned in the Wonderbox time with Ali, I realize not everyone is, and I strive to ask permission before hugging, but I just love offering and receiving hugs, and it is a perk of ministry that it is usually part of my job description. And this will come as no surprise to anyone who knows me even a little bit, but I am also an extrovert. That doesn't mean, as some people assume, that I'm gregarious and outgoing, although sometimes that is the case. Extroversion and introversion refers to how you get your energy. As an extrovert, I get my energy from being around people, whereas introverts need alone time to recharge. The energy exchange that happens during Sunday mornings in the service, in the hallways, with the kids running around, in coffee hour, I would leave each week feeling simultaneously physically tired, but emotionally and spiritually energized. Those moments of embrace were entirely thrown out last March when the pandemic descended upon us and in order to stay physically safe, we needed to stay physically separate. As an extrovert, my recharge opportunities of being around people disappeared. Now, I am very thankful for the possibilities granted to us by Zoom, YouTube, Facebook, email, and all the other online ways that we are staying connected, but it is so not the same. Don't get me wrong, I enjoy the 10 second commute and the fact that I usually get to wear slippers when I'm preaching, but I would put on real shoes in a minute if it meant that I could give you a hug. Right now, as we stand on a precipice, our geographic area being among the very worst hot spots for COVID outbreak in our country, with national and local elections only a couple days away, the results looming far or near in the future, we don't know, with ongoing political and civil unrest and uprising, 
All, all of this, just as the air outside is getting colder, outdoor gatherings are becoming less and less possible, we are all in need of embrace. And this is why we exist. This is why we here at the fellowship and religious communities in general exist. We exist to provide a loving embrace, especially for those who need it the most. Recently at our governing board meeting, we were discussing the desire that we all have to come to the fellowship to be comforted. And yet, how it is such an important part of our theological tradition not to just sit back and passively receive the comfort, but to provide healing and justice to the world through our actions. One of the things that came up at that board meeting was the idea, which is often attributed to theologian Martin Marty, that God afflicts the comfortable and comforts the afflicted. And therefore, religious traditions ought to as well. It is our job to urge those of us with comfort to move toward loving action, even if it makes us uncomfortable. And then, as we say in the South, to love on those who need comfort. Now, finding where we are on that spectrum of comfortable versus afflicted, and of course, on our, our place on that spectrum is going to change, that finding that place on the spectrum can be a challenge, particularly if it changes day to day or moment to moment, and it does. Many of us are bursting with blessings in this life things to be grateful for, privileges we possess, and even those of us with blessings, privileges, we are struggling, especially right now. We are grieving lost loved ones and having to do so from a distance. We are grieving missed opportunities. We are stressed about the day-to-day decision-making and the systems that are failing all of us. But some among us are, as is sometimes said, at the margins, already pushed aside in a world that centers power and privilege. And the pandemic and the political unrest have made those margins even more vulnerable. As I've been thinking about this concept of embrace, I was recently made aware of a concept that the Lutheran pastor Nadia Boltz Weber wrote about in her book, Shameless. She also shared it in a recent blog post entitled Corners. Here's what she wrote. When looking out the window of an airplane at the geometry of industrial agriculture below me, I'd wonder, like a dumbass city girl, why in the world do farmers plant crops of circles, plant circles of crops in lots that are square? Well, after a little research, I discovered that in 1940, Just 29 miles from my apartment, a man named Frank Zybach invented the center pivot irrigation system, essentially revolutionizing farming in America. In his system, the watering equipment turns on a pivot, allowing sprinklers to water the crops in a circular pattern. It ends up The crops aren't planted in circles, they're just watered that way. The water never gets to the crops in the corners. God, Nadia Boltz Weber writes, planted so many of us 
in the corners. And yet, she says, the center pivot teachings of the church never seem to make their way to us. She continues at the end of her blog post, quote, it may feel as though some of us have been relegated to the corners, but here's the thing. From the corners, I can see the whole room. I love the corners. I always have. It is where I will always choose to sit because I love outcasts, queers, the girls who talk too loud. I love humor that comes out of lives that have not been easy. I love drunks, single dads, sex workers, and the guy who lost a leg in the war. These are my people. So here's what I hope, she writes, that what is shared here is water, God willing, for those planted in the corners. End quote. And this is my hope too. As Unitarian Universalists, we are uniquely positioned to be a truly, authentically welcoming faith. We open our arms to people of many paths in life without concern for creed or doctrine. We hold the doors wide open for people who have historically been excluded from traditional faiths. But in some ways, we continue to fall short of our goal and our potential. We, as you use, sometimes have a tendency to get stuck. We get stuck in partisanship. We get stuck in classism. And we focus sometimes on irrelevant battles. Nancy McDonald Ladd minister in the Washington, D.C. area calls them fake fights. These irrelevant battles are about terminology or particular expressions of theology. Do we use God language or not? This hymn or that hymn? Robert's Rules of Order! And we forget that our focus is embrace. Our focus, our purpose, is to provide the embrace that each of us needs at some time or another, and definitely right now, and to focus on embracing those who Boltz Weber says are planted in the corners. What a beautiful focus. Embrace. So much more meaningful and fun than all that other stuff, right? Now, as a minister, I get to be a close observer of people. And I have learned one very important thing about human nature, that we are full of contradictions. I absolutely know for sure that I need to eat healthy food when I'm feeling stress. But time and time again, I find myself in the kitchen with a bowl of Fruit Loops as a sugar-laden coping mechanism. I love Fruit Loops. We need the fellowship and we need our spiritual practices the most in times of crisis. And yet it is one of the easiest things to let go when all the other demands of life impede upon our time and our energy. Trust me, you will receive no guilt None, zero, from me or from any of us here at the fellowship if you can't make it regularly to services or if you haven't logged your kid onto RE yet. No guilt. We get it. And yet we know that what we are offering here by the staff and the lay leaders is providing that sustenance and embrace that we know that people really need right now. So we hope that you will take advantage of it in whatever way you are able. Logging on to YouTube and watching the service as you fold laundry after your kids are in bed is a totally valid way for you to connect to your fellowship right now. No guilt. Do what you need to do. 
but know that we are here and we love you and embrace you all the same. Another contradiction in human nature is that we tend to love to offer support to one another, but we are afraid to ask if it is specifically needed, and we are even more afraid to ask when we are in need. I've done it, and I see this over and over again at the fellowship as your minister. People poured in generous support for our minister's discretionary fund at the beginning of the pandemic. We now have more funds than we have ever had in the past to offer to people who are in need. And yet people rarely take us up on the offer when we, when we offer it. I appreciate the power of pride and dignity, not wanting to take a handout. But on the other hand, the offer is there. We have extended it. The system doesn't work if everybody wants to cook a casserole, but nobody is willing to eat one. Embrace is a two-way street. Both people have to open their arms. Both people have to be willing to offer and accept the embrace. Allie spoke about vulnerability in her reflection, and I think that vulnerability is some of what is behind this human contradiction. Not wanting to be wrong or weak or whatever it is that is holding us back from the yes of true embrace. I love the positive spin that Reverend Sean Parker Dennison shared in the poem we heard earlier. To invoke love, Parker Dennison writes, to invoke love is to approach each day and every person with wonder, anticipating love's arrival. Is this the moment? Is this love's grand entrance? Is this person the embodiment of love? Am I the one? This to me flips the whole concept of vulnerability on its head and gives excitement and anticipation to each embrace. Is this offer of a casserole or this card in the mail or this check for $300? Is this love's grand entrance? Is this person who is providing chairs and water bottles at the polls the embodiment of love? Is my effort to support Black-led organizations emerging out of my own commitment to love? Is this how we will give and receive embrace in these times? And yet, Parker Dennison also reminds us to invoke love is to take the risk of inviting chaos to visit the space that you spent so much time making tidy and watch as the breath of life scatters everything you have only just folded and put away. To offer and receive embrace is not a guaranteed success, which returns us to Ali's point about vulnerability. There is risk inherent in embrace. And yet this is the risk of living fully, of embracing each other and reaching into the corners to offer embrace beyond the circle. We might mess up. We might get it wrong. We can feel certain that we will not do any of this perfectly. It will not be tidy. It might be chaotic. But when I look back at that picture from the Wonder Box of me and Leah hugging up here, with so many of you looking on from the congregation, it was a risk. It was a risk for you to call me as your minister. 
It was a risk for Leah and I to agree to be on a ministry team together. We might have not been a good fit at all, but it turns out we work really well together. It was a risk for each of us to commit to this faith, which asks a lot of us, even in hard times. That moment of embrace and so many of the ones that have come after. Wow. We know when it feels right. I'm so glad we took this risk together. I hope we can continue to take them. I hope even as the world continues to be hard and scary and filled to the brim with anxiety for all of us, and especially those who live where the water doesn't easily reach. I hope we will embrace each other again and again and again in all the ways that we as a faith community do best through our love and connection and support and commitment. May you open your arms, exposing your vulnerable heart, invoking love to be love for someone else. May you feel the embrace and lean yourself gently into it. May we embrace each other, even now, from a distance. May it be so, and amen.
In this community of embrace, we share our individual joys and concerns. This is a binding practice. It ties us to each other so that whatever we face in life, we hopefully do not have to bear it alone. We invite you now to type into the chat box any personal news you might wish to share. In this way, we will witness and hold space with you as we continue to worship. If you would like to connect with me, another minister, or a care team member, please let me know directly. You may also send in your joys and concerns by using the form on our website or by emailing anyone on staff. We will include those in our weekly email to which any member or friend may subscribe by contacting our office. We cannot embrace each other physically right now, but we can breathe together as we share a connected silence linked across our screens. There are many kinds of embrace. Let us breathe quietly together and then join our voices in sung response. For generosity. Remembering that the acts of giving and receiving are spiritual practices. As always, if you are in need of financial or emotional support, please reach out to any of our ministers, Reverend Christina, Reverend Leah, or myself, so that we can offer help, including modest financial support through the minister's discretionary fund. For those of you who are feeling relatively more financially secure, we want to thank you for continuing to give. And we ask that you keep doing so. There are several ways you can give to the fellowship and many reasons to do so. Here are just a few. I love the fellowship. I stay with the fellowship because it's a spiritual home with, that I could not find anywhere else in the world. It's a place where there have been sacraments for my family, a place where my children have been educated in spirituality, a place where I have been through changes and growth in my own life. And it's really the only place that uplifts me in all of the ways that I'm looking for. And I will stay with it forever. As we come to the end of our service, we will extinguish our chalice flame, even as we still hold its light in our hearts. As we extinguish this flame, let us go our ways with hope in our hearts, with our spirits renewed, and with a deeper understanding of life's mystery. Let us carry the light of compassion and commitment to build a better world.
After our closing words, we will be having small breakout groups just like usual for 15 minutes of connection and conversation. In a moment, we will hear a short postlude song. If you do not want to participate in small group conversations, then please use that postlude music to log off and leave this Zoom meeting. If you choose to stay, I encourage you to learn each other's names and to pay attention to the timer in the corner of your screen so that everyone gets a chance to share. And with that, go in resilience, growing in strength. Go in connection to yourself, your community, and your world. Go in peace, knowing we embrace each other, even now, from a distance.